a Spanish gentleman uh, around 1535, uh, but there's a lot of evidence to suggest that there were South American peoples there prior to that, uh, things like dishes and pots and whatnot, uh, but no homes or graves. So they assume that maybe these islands were just some sort of like ceremonial purpose and they just traveled there uh, once in a while. Uh, the Galapagos appeared on maps in 1570, so they were named the Galapagos for the tortoises, as that's what the people there had called them, tortoises. Uh, after that, it was visited by, you know, pirates, sailors, whalers. Uh, Ecuador eventually took control, and then a few years after that is when the voyage of the Beagle actually arrived. Uh, and then the islands continued up until how we know them nowadays with the National Park and Tourism. Okay, there we go. So in 1835, when the Beagle actually made it to the Galapagos, uh, Charles Darwin wasn't actually on the vessel to be anything special. He was a, a rather unmotivated medical scholar. Uh, and he was offered this position on the Beagle as a naturalist by one of his friends. And the voyage of the Beagle was intended to survey the coasts around South America, make notes on the environment. And that's sort of why Charles Darwin ended up there uh, collecting species and looking at all the different animals along the coast. They stopped in the Galapagos uh, before their trip back to England and stayed there for only about five weeks. And that is where Darwin saw all sorts of things that helped him formulate this idea of evolution by natural selection. Uh, but contrary to what they want you to believe, it didn't just happen immediately upon him arriving in the islands. In fact, the whole uh, Finch study didn't even happen until after he returned to England and was examining some of the species that him and his colleagues had collected. Uh, it was the differences in things like the Galapagos Mockingbird, uh, which is up in the top right here, and tortoises. Uh, and those differences of those individuals across the islands that originally started this idea for Darwin. Uh, where he was unsure about how members of the same group could be so different. And then the finches he examined afterwards, that sort of settled the questions that he still had in his mind. So of course, I learned all about this and Darwin and the Beagle and the Galapagos in university uh, when I was doing my undergrad in biology. So there was always that excitement of visiting the islands one day and then generally being an animal lover, it's a place that I've always wanted to visit since David Attenborough has spoken about it so highly. Uh, so I'm really grateful that I finally got the opportunity to do so. So when Darwin visited the islands, uh, the English governor there, Nicholas Lawson, told him that you could figure out what island a tortoise came from by the shape of its shell. And this was in fact largely true. And it's one of the points that helped Darwin develop his idea of natural selection and evolution. So there are two main categories of shell shape. There's the dome-shaped tortoises and then the saddleback tortoises. The saddleback tortoises live on islands where there's a lot of vegetation that requires them to reach high up into the vegetation to feed, whereas the dome-shaped tortoises live on islands where there's plenty of suitable vegetation kind of near ground level. So they don't have like a huge gape above their neck, whereas the saddlebacks, the, the shell really flips up above their neck there. I see my cursor is stuck. Okay, the whole thing is stuck. Are you guys still seeing the uh, dome shape versus saddleback tortoises there? Yeah. Oh. I might uh, just stop this and then try to restart it and see if that fixes the issue. Sorry about this. Okay. Ah. All right, I'll try this one more time. And hopefully it uh, doesn't happen again. Okay, fingers crossed everybody. Okay, while there are two broad categories of tortoise uh, based on shell shape, there's about 16 species that have been identified, although four of those are now extinct. Uh, so this infographic is from the Charles Darwin Research Station where they are still doing some genetic studies 
on these different tortoises and how they're related. So some of these species we only know about because of like empty tortoise shells that were found on these islands after they had been feasted upon by all of those visitors to the Galapagos that I had mentioned before. Um, or they were killed by because they were outcompeted by animals that the settlers brought with them. Thankfully, there are still lots of tortoises left on the island, which I'll show you next. Um, and this is your disclaimer that now the majority of this talk is going to be a display of biodiversity, showing a decent selection of the wildlife that we saw on the trip and some fun facts about these animals. And if there were more time, I'd probably show you some plants and some lava, but I think I already have too much. So animals it is. These are the tortoises that still live on the island uh, and invasive species are a problem still for these gentle giants so things like cats and dogs and pigs are all a threat to them. In addition to that they have a natural threat which is volcanoes uh, since the islands are all volcanic and some of them still have active volcanoes on them. Uh, there are breeding programs to try to help these tortoise populations out and move them from the areas that might be directly impacted by the volcanoes. They're very big. They can weigh up to 250 kilograms. Uh, and one of the tortoises at the Charles Darwin Research Station put on 175 kilograms in 15 years, uh, which is a feat that I hope to never achieve. Uh, but their rate of growth is actually determined by just food availability. And in the wet years, they actually produce faster growth. And you can trace that by the rings on their shell. They are hopefully as you saw from that video, very slow moving. They like to hang out in water occasionally. They can live to be at least 150 years old. Uh, they reach sexual maturity at 20 to 25. And it's been said that the loudest noise in the Galapagos bush is tortoises mating, which I actually believe because when we were at this area, we followed the sound of that tortoise to find where they were. Okay. Uh, Darwin described the marine iguana as a hideous looking creature of a dirty black color, stupid and sluggish in their movements, but he was really impressed with how they swam in the water with perfect ease and swiftness. So I'm thoroughly impressed by the Galapagos marine iguana. They're the only seagoing lizard in the world. Uh, there are several subspecies that vary in color and size from island to island. Uh, you can see on this male here, they have a pronounced crest that runs down their back. So Darwin saw them in the water when they were feeding on algae underwater, but they are also known to feed on their own feces and even that of sea lions and crabs, which I don't think I ever saw, but I kind of wish I did. Uh, they're ectothermic or cold-blooded. So after they spend time in the water feeding on those al um, algae, they like to bask in the sun or on lava rocks to heat up. Uh, so that's what you're seeing on the right photo there, that aggregation of uh, iguanas. Uh, and when they can't actually just bask in the sun on their own, they will all pile on top of one another. And you'll see them like that. Uh, throughout the days, we saw a lot of lazy iguanas or ones that wanted to look incredibly majestic, I suppose, as they looked out at the ocean. Uh, one of my personal favorites is that iguana in the lower left that looks like it has a comb over or a faux hawk, but it is incredibly stylish. Uh, you have to be really cautious anytime you're walking, <laughs> anytime you're walking diamonds, because the iguanas will just lay down right in the middle of the path. Uh, they're kind of everywhere and you're at risk of just stepping right on them because they're not always incredibly active. But I don't want to give you the wrong impression. Uh, not all of the iguanas are just incredibly lazy. All of the iguanas here, uh, we're trying to be very threatening with their head nods and their mouths open and their tongues sticking out. Uh, so this is like a, a territorial display when you're getting too close to them or too close to each other. Um, I happen to be crouched down making a video of some iguanas in the background there. Um, but this guy took that really personally and he clearly threatened me, but then I guess decided that he just wanted to be the center of attention instead. Uh, and unfortunately my camera wasn't able to focus on that, but he was very relaxed afterwards. If I were an iguana, I'm sure the outcome would have looked a lot more like this. Uh, these are two territorial iguanas, literally butting heads and pushing into each other. So they'll do this when they wanna fight over territory or females. Uh, 
it was always really fun to see this on the islands. There was a lot of commentary from everybody on the boat, which is exactly why this video is muted. <laughs> but uh, as much as these iguanas love the water, uh, they are susceptible to El Nino events where warmer water can lead to the disappearance of the green algae that they actually prefer to feed on. Uh, when this happens, usually there's an increase in the brown algae, but the lizards can't easily digest it and it can actually be toxic, bleh, toxic to them as well. So with the reduction in food, they're at risk of dying by starvation. But we have somewhat recently discovered that marine iguanas actually have a way to combat this, which is that they shrink and like not just in their weight, but also in total body length. And they can become as much as 20% shorter during some sort of El Nino event or in the years after that. Um, so cartilage and connective tissue make up like 10% of the animal's length. Uh, but since they're getting up to 20% shorter, it's believed that this reduction in size is actually a result of the iguanas reabsorbing some of their own bone matter. I think that's really cool and I hope people are still studying this to figure out exactly what's going on. Aside from the marine iguanas, we also saw a few land iguanas. Uh, so there's a few different species of these. This one is just the land iguana species. Uh, these guys make large burrows on the land, uh, like that big hole in the middle photo there. Apparently back in the day when Darwin visited, there were just so many iguanas and so many burrows that Darwin had troubles pitching a tent due to the number of burrows on the land. I don't know if I buy that. I suppose I do. Um, land iguanas are also mostly vegetarian. I'm not sure about the, the feces eating aspect of that, but they do like to eat prickly pear cactus. Um, and this one that we saw on the photo on the right there, or the video rather, was clearly snacking on something. The iguanas are not the only lizards and other reptiles that you'll find. Lava lizards are pretty much everywhere. There's seven species of lava lizards. They all look like little mini versions of the iguana, also equally majestic, as you can see from the bottom two photos there. They have different colorations and sizes, but they're all pretty easily distinguished from iguanas. They are omnivorous, eating things like insects and some plant matter. Uh, and this one that's hiding on the top left image there, it was sitting on that whitish plant and it was actually eating some of the buds off of the plant while we were watching it. I only saw one gecko. There's five species and I think only two of them are endemic. Um, but this gecko is nocturnal, eats insects, and somewhat unfortunately is often found in buildings. So that's one of the ways that this guy is impacted by humans. Um, this is exactly where I saw this gecko though. We were having dinner at a restaurant one evening and it was hanging out on a picture that was hanging on the wall. And then we did see it eat an insect as well. Okay, these crabs are everywhere. Uh, so these are Sally Lightfoot crabs. Uh, it's a species you're pretty much guaranteed to see anywhere you go in the Galapagos. They are really easy to spot with their bright red and orange shells. And the underside, which you can see a little bit on the picture in the left, uh, they have a whitish blue color to them. As juveniles, they're really dark in color. They blend in really well with the lava rock. But then as adults, they're just bright and out there. And you can see them all over the place. Uh, my favorite part about these crabs was I actually saw them like jumping from rock to rock on numerous occasions, which was surprising for me and like the crabs I'm used to seeing around here. Uh, and if you get the chance, there's a great like Blue Planet or Planet Earth video, of course, narrated by David Attenborough, where one of these crabs is running for its life from an eel or octopus that are after it. And you can actually see that jumping action. Uh, the Sally Lightfoot crabs were not the only crabs we saw, um, but some of these crabs, like the ghost crab, uh, were really hard to spot. They were everywhere on the beaches, but they're really fast and excellent at hiding. So the best I can show you is a photo of this little crab poking its, itself out of the hole. If you see them up close, they have these really tall eye stalks that are great for peeking above the surface of the sand when they are hiding in their holes. Okay, and one more crab that we saw was this semi-terrestrial hermit crab. I'm not exactly sure what species. I think there's only about two on the islands. Um, but they are a scavenger that spends some of their time on land and then some of their time in the intertidal zone. Now we're just going through these animals. Okay, I thought it was worthwhile to include some endemic insects here because we certainly saw insects and occasionally felt them like sting or bite us. Uh, but these endemic insects are special 
because there's a limited number of insects on the islands because the islands are so remote. And some of the insects that are there now are also invasive. So why not show off a couple of these endemic locusts, even though we might not always think of locusts as the greatest insects out there. So this large painted locust is shockingly a large colorful locust, but it actually camouflages pretty well in its habitat. We saw it a lot more in like the highlands where there is some green or some, you know, dirt paths or, you know, compressed lava sediment. Uh, so they, they're really good at hiding. Uh, even better at hiding though is this small painted locust, which I'm impressed we ever actually saw. Uh, it blends right in there with the lava rocks there. So that photo on the right is the antenna from a uh, radio that we were using to communicate with the boat. And it's right underneath that tip of the antenna. So you can see just how small it is and just how good it is at camouflaging. Okay, this one was really fun to see. You don't know what it is yet. It's very small. I doubt you can see it on your screens, but this one was a Galapagos scorpion. Uh, it was like, you can see how small it is with those grains of sand in the background there. I'm also surprised that we found this very tiny animal. Okay, supposedly these scorpions, the sting isn't really bad for humans, but the naturalist that we had with us on our trip said that he stepped on one accidentally as a kid and ended up with a really high fever that landed him in the hospital. So we did still keep a respectable difference, uh, distance away from this guy. Those are my odds and ends animals. Now we're gonna get into more of like the marine mammals and, and birds where there are also videos involved. So the Galapagos sea lion is the largest animal found on the islands. They are everywhere and they really don't care about humans as long as you're using common sense and being respectful towards them. So for example, this mom and her pup just came right up to us where we were sitting on the beach. Suppose they wanted our area. Oh. So they'll just sit right in the middle of the pathway or dock or wherever you're trying to go and you just have to maneuver around them. Or like these ones, they'll just come right up to you. Uh, they feed on fish and the normal population of sea lions in the Galapagos is estimated to be about 50,000. Although like the marine iguanas, El Nino events can reduce this number because it reduces the food supply that's actually available to them. Aside from the populated areas where you're stepping over them, they also like to hang out at the beach where they have their own little spa routine of rolling in the sand to keep the flies off of them and then making their own bubble baths by blowing bubbles out of their noses and mouths. And then once they're done in their own little personal jacuzzi, they uh, go for a little swim, stretch their flippers in their own private pool. So they are incredibly entertaining and just really sweet to watch all the time. They're very curious. And there were numerous encounters where we would be snorkeling and a sea lion would come up and interact with us. They're a lot of fun to swim with because they're curious and they want to play. Um, sometimes they'll mimic you. So if you like dive down and roll underwater or spin underwater, they'll do the same thing. This one, kept picking up like rocks and shells off the bottom and chewing on them, spitting them out, bringing them up into my face and then swimming away. So they were a lot of fun to interact with. And I was always really excited when we were snorkeling and the sea lions would come up and hang out with us. Uh, they definitely do just remind me of dogs underwater. All right, I think this might go on for a bit. Thought I cut it. 
buds. Uh, a very similar looking animal uh, is the Galapagos fur seal. I know they're called fur seals, but they're actually in the sea lion family as well. So fur sea lion would be a lot more appropriate. No, we didn't ever go snorkeling with these guys. Um, they are not as commonly seen as the sea lions. They like to feed on squid, which are commonly found much deeper than the fish in general that the sea lions are eating on. So they like to rest on rocky shorelines that are near deeper waters, kind of on the outer shores of the archipelago, um, because they can feed up to depths of 100 meters. Uh, you can distinguish them from the sea lions by their smaller size. They have larger, like prominent eyes and a shorter snout. So I think it's a little bit easier to see with this little one here. Uh, so this small fur seal was hobbling around on the rocks and trying to head down to the water. Um, so I was focused on that, but then I was also distracted by the two adult fur seals that were arguing in the cave in the background, which you should see again in a second. Um, these seals were hunted to near extinction in the 19th century because of their fur, uh, but their numbers have bounced back and they are not currently under threat. Everywhere we went, I was always amazed by the fact that you could just walk up so closely to these animals or they would come up so closely to you. It was very different than the wildlife we're familiar with here. These guys were arguing and I had just caught the end of one of their arguments, which I thought was very entertaining. So those are the only two uh, mammals that we really saw. Uh, no whales or dolphins to report, unfortunately. Um, but there was a lot of birds. So this is now the bird section. Okay, these birds were ones that I was most excited to see. Um, these flightless cormorants are the only cormorant found on the islands. Um, their status is vulnerable, as there's only about 900 individuals. And they are also susceptible to high mortality during El Nino events. Um, they are also, like many other animals, threatened by introduced species like dogs and cats that will prey on them. Um, they can't exactly fly to get away. So as you can see, they also have these brilliant blue eyes, um, like in that top image there. Um, and their wings are just hilarious for a bird, but they don't need those. They don't fly. Instead, they are catching their food by swimming and diving. And we were lucky enough again to see this on multiple occasions. There were many instances where our national park naturalist would tell us about previous visits where people would only see like maybe one flightless cormorant, but we were just incredibly lucky to see them constantly while we were snorkeling. Uh, so they feed on fish, eels, octopus, um, and they catch them relatively close to shore, hopefully very soon you'll see how big and powerful their feet are that's what's using to them what they're using to propel themselves while diving and they're like pretty voracious hunters this guy was going under all sorts of rocks and everywhere to catch this fish the flightless cormorants were not the only birds that were flightless, that were diving that we saw. There was also the Galapagos penguins, which were also one of my favorites. I think they're one of the coolest things that I saw. Uh, the Galapagos penguin is one of the smallest penguins in the world. It's the only penguin that breeds entirely in the tropics and the only one to be found in the Northern hemisphere. We saw them a lot more than I was expecting, uh, but that being said, they are still endangered. Um, their current population is thought to be around 2,000 individuals, but they were severely affected by the 1982 to 90, 1983 El Nino, which reduced their population by about 75%, and then again by the 97 to 98 El Nino, which again reduced their population by then 65%. Um, so these El Ninos are affecting their food supply, which was the reason for this penguin decline. And populations are recovering, 
but rather slowly because they're slow breeders and their breeding success is affected again by El Nino. Um, researchers have identified that there's a lack of suitable breeding sites, which is hindering them. So they're experimenting with building nesting caves out of lava rock for these penguins to help with their recovery. Uh, and the results are promising, but the other issue for these penguins is that there are still introduced animals like cats and dogs that are scaring them out of these breeding areas or actually preying on them. Uh, when they were on land, you'd occasionally hear them fall and they make this donkey-like bray, which is very entertaining. Um, they're awkward on land, but definitely really graceful underwater and really fast swimmers too. So this was an instance where we saw them hunting underwater. They like to eat small fish, um, no more than about two kilometers away from shore, but they can actually go up to 50 meters deep, which I think is very impressive for a bird. Uh, this was, again, just us snorkeling. They get incredibly close to you because they don't seem to care about human presence at all either. Um, I think that's one of the, the special parts about the Galapagos is all of these animals and your interactions with them are very like tightly regulated. So it doesn't seem like any of these animals have a, a fear of humans because they're always treated with respect and you're, you know, you're always staying away from them, never touching them. So I, I appreciate that. These swallow-tailed gulls, I didn't even know existed beforehand, but they are also one of my favorites now. Um, they're these large, graceful black and white gulls. They're the only nocturnal gull in the world. Uh, so they're also the only night feeding gull in the world. Um, because of that, little is known about their feeding habits, uh, but we do know that they feed about 15 to, to 30 kilometers away from land. And it's thought that they must have some sort of special visual or sonar faculties to help them travel and feed at night. Apparently they make a strange clicking sound, which is thought to be some form of echolocation to help them navigate at night. Um, though I don't know how much evidence there is for that or if anybody's researched it. Um, and they also have this bright red ring around their eye, which may assist them with night vision. Um, this is another example of an animal that evidently has no fear of humans, as this pair on the right was right beside the pathway. And uh, as you can see from the photo, started to engage in over three minutes of courtship and mating while we just stood right beside them and watched. Um, which was a pretty cool thing to see, actually, because uh, as much as I see birds even around here, I've never seen quite that style of display. Okay, on to the blue-footed booby. Uh, the blue-footed booby has big blue feet. They are pretty clownish, which is how they garnered their name booby from the Spanish word bobo, which means stupid or foolish or clown, because they are rather awkward on land and during their courtship performance. Their feet are bright blue in color because of their diet of fish that contains carotenoids. And those carotenoids are integrated into the collagen of the booby's feet. So their feet color can actually be an indication of the bird's health. And this also plays into mating, where when these birds are looking for a mate, they're looking for a mate with the bluest feet. Um, and scientists did an experiment where they dulled the blue color of a partnered male's feet to see how the female partner would respond. And the eggs that she produced were then much smaller than normal. Um, so less mater maternal investment in this partnership with a seemingly unhealthy male. Um, same goes for females. There's a breeding hierarchy where the females with the bluest feet are the most desirable. As much as everybody loves these animals, or at least I think everybody does, they are also in serious decline um, from more than 10,000 pairs in the 1960s down to around 3,000 pairs in 2012. Um, again, the decline is related to a dramatic drop in their food source of sardines that occurred during the 97 to 98 El Nino. So they are endangered. We saw a single Nazca booby, which I felt like we were pretty lucky to see it all as we were sailing one evening. So this is all I have to show you from the Nazca booby. They are the largest booby and they have this really like elegant white body with a black masked face and black primary feathers and a tail, black tail. Okay, I feel like I'm running out of time. The Galapagos hawk is the only resident hawk. They live on all of the major islands, but unfortunately was eradicated from two of those major islands by humans. Uh, they are a predator and scavenger. They'll feed on virtually anything, especially things like young iguanas, lizards, birds, insects, and then the occasional dead sea lion. 
What's interesting about these birds is that they engage in cooperative polyandry, which means that a female will mate with up to four different males, all of whom will help with the incubation and rearing the young. So this increases the chances of reproductive success. Despite this, the Galapagos hawk is a very vulnerable species, and there's only thought to be about 120 to 150 pairs, um, but around 800 individual birds. Uh, and to give you an idea of how they got eradicated from those two islands by humans, um, Darwin commented on how he moved one of these birds out of the way by pushing the branch that it was sitting on with the barrel of his gun. So at some point, they really had no fear of humans, and unfortunately, their species suffered as a result of it. Uh, we saw these herons somewhat frequently. Uh, the lava heron on the right there is found along rocky shores and mangrove lagoons. Uh, they're often seen stalking Sally Lightfoot crabs, those bright red crabs on the rocks with that one there. Um, when they are breeding, they have uh, dark bluish gray on their wings and back, and then a paler chest and belly. They have a bright yellow eye and bright orange legs. And then that bottom left lava heron, that is an immature lava heron. Uh, where its legs are gray and the bill is silver gray and it's kind of just brownish and looks a little bit striated. And those immature lava herons are, even, uh, are often easily confused with the striated heron that you're seeing there on the left. Um, but you can tell the difference because the striated heron actually has a yellow line between the eye and the base of its bill. That's about it in terms of distinguishing the difference between them. Uh, they were really entertaining for me to see because they are so different than our great blue heron. They're these tiny stout little things and they do still have a lengthy neck, but it's usually tucked up unless they're hunting. Okay, I thought these doves, <laughs> the Lapagos doves were actually kind of pretty, uh, but the wildlife guidebook that I have here describes them as a rather dumpy looking pigeon. And apparently Darwin didn't think much higher of them as he was able to kill one of these doves for the stew pot by throwing his hat at it. Uh, I'm intrigued by the random stories or phrases from Darwin that you can find on the internet. And I'm just thoroughly believing that they're all true. <laughs> um, these doves are not afraid of man and their population has suffered as a result. Though I struggle to find an actual population size only that it is in fact decreasing. One of the last birds I have to show you are the frigate birds. Um, there's two different species of frigate bird. They're rather hard to distinguish at a distance. And honestly, even up close, I wasn't entirely sure what I was looking at all the time. The great frigate bird is smaller and has a greenish sheen on its back, while the magnificent frigate bird has a slightly purplish sheen on its back. Um, but when I look at iridescent feathers, I feel like they're always a little bit green and purple. So I was not able to successfully determine who's who. Frigate birds in general have the largest wingspan to weight ratio of any species of bird, and they are incredibly adept at soaring. They would often soar around the boat as we traveled to a new location or just sit right on the boat and get a free ride. Um, we visited an island where they breed and nest. So that photo on the right, the little white fuzzy guy there is a chick with its parent. We also saw a couple of little breeding displays from the males. Um, one of which ended in this male bird flying away with his uh, throat pouch still inflated. So normally they inflate this big balloon-like pouch under their jaw and then lift their heads up and spread their wings and do this like chest shimmy while they make a funny noise. Um, but this one we just happened to see with that thing inflated as it flew away, which looked incredibly awkward. So Kelsey, maybe we'll uh, finish off next slide. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, uh, funny that I'm the marine biologist here, but I'm talking about nothing but land animals and birds. The flamingo, this is the American flamingo, but it's a resident. So it managed to make it to the Galapagos by its own means um, and isn't considered an invasive. They have a plumage that kind of varies with how much they're able to eat. So it's the same thing where there's a carotenoid that they are eating from the often brine shrimp that they're finding in these pools. Um, Yet again, another species that is really susceptible to El Nino. So more precipitation means the water levels in these lagoons rise and they're unable to access the bottom sediment and stir it up to find their crustacean food. Um, so this has direct impacts on their feeding and where they're nesting. Um, and the latest count in 2014, there was only about 300 individuals left. 
So they are in the vulnerable category. Okay, I'll stop it there. If anybody else wants to see uh, marine life, you can stick around and I can show a couple things afterwards. But other than that, yes. <laughs> so we have, um, we have some thanks, Kelsey. We do have some questions in the chat. Um, so I thought if uh, we could uh, spend the next minutes with those, that would be great. Of course. Um, first question is how far can the marine iguanas swim? <laughs> oh man, I love that you asked this. I was having this discussion earlier. I don't actually know the answer to that, but the idea is that all of these animals on the Galapagos made it by their own means. So I'm going to say a thousand kilometers. Wow. <laughs> Not actually that long. Um, they were probably drifted there as well by the current. Um, but let's say like 10 kilometers would be maybe my guess if they had to. Great. I can look it up and get back to you. Um, next question is, what are some common threats to these species in the Galapagos? Maybe a little bit more. Yeah, so, pardon me, a little bit more about that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, there, I think the invasives is the, the biggest thing right now. So a lot of the birds are suffering from this parasitic fly called Philornis downsy, which uh, enters their nest and actually like embeds itself in the nasal cavities of these fledgling birds or the baby birds. And they feed on like blood and the tissue there, but it ends up in these wounds on relatively small birds and uh, it, it ends up killing them. So there's a lot of uh, fly catchers and a bunch of the finches, including the mangrove finch that is like critically endangered at this point. There's only like 14 pairs of those left. So it's a bad situation. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Um, next question um, from Sarah Richardson. Um, is it like with rabbits where they're trying to capture some of the nutrients that couldn't be absorbed the first time through the digestive tract? So when the iguanas eating feces? Yeah. I would, I would assume that's the case. They're just collecting all the extra yeah, algae and whatnot that other animals couldn't absorb or that they couldn't absorb the first time. Right. And then uh, finally from Jonathan Gill, what conservation efforts have been done on the islands? Oh, we have some more after it. Oh, that's okay. Uh, so there was a period of time where it was kind of a free for all for tourism, but they've really reined in uh, how many people there are and how many tour operators there are. So when you go to the islands, you need to be with a national park naturalist anytime you set foot in the national park, which is most of the Galapagos. Uh, and I mean, there, there's other things that are happening in terms of, uh, controlling invasive populations. So at one period of time, there were, uh, an obscene amount of goats on one of the islands and they actually just totally exterminated all of those goats. Um, there's research being done on that parasitic fly. Um, and then there's a lot of breeding programs, things like for the tortoises. I'm not sure how successful they are with things like birds, um, but it seems like there's a lot of people that care and there's a research station right on the islands that kind of works in cooperation with some of the other governments to uh, help make sure all of these animals survive. Thank you. And a question from Carrie Antoniazzi. Um, I believe the Galapagos Cocos Swimway is a hope spot. Did the naturalist talk about this and how a designation like this changes how the area is, pro is protected? I am unfamiliar with that actually I'm sorry so no the naturalist didn't talk about it but like if you want to, if you want to type anything else about it I'd be interested to hear about it or even just turn your mic on and let us know if not I totally understand that as well <laughs> mic on if you'd like to Carrie <laughs> hi yeah so Dr. Sylvia hi. Earl hi so Dr. Sylvia Earl has her uh, mission blue work and hope spots are some of the areas um, around the world that are more vulnerable, that have a big diversity. And so I was just yeah. wondering, like, what changes may have been put in place in conservation since that designation? Uh, Ooh, no, I, I'm not too sure. I, I might have to, I have, to go. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> I have to go to the Galapagos to get you that yeah, answer. Yeah. I'll go back. It's fine. <laughs> it's on my list. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, and one more question um, from Martina, Martina Petkov. Is it tempting to touch the animals when they are the ones that get super close to you? 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. Man, like those penguins were always coming right up in your face. And it was like, if I just move this GoPro out a little bit more, I could, I could poke it. I, I didn't. Um, th there was somebody in our group that sneakily touched the sea line, but got caught. And we were all pretty happy that that person got caught because if nobody else got to touch one, they definitely shouldn't have touched one. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, and we have uh, another two questions here. Nice. Um, is it tempting to touch? Oh, we got that one. Um, what island is it? Yeah, so we did Santa Cruz, Isabella, Fernandina, um, Santiago, and North Seymour, and like Baltra. And then I guess we stopped at like smaller islands, like Chinese Hat Island. We kind of circled around that as well. And uh, another interesting question. Um, I'm curious to know if anyone else on the call has visited the Galapagos. And maybe if you have, you could. Uh, <laughs> Me if too. Yeah, great. Um, and if there's anybody um, right now who who has a question or a comment um, that would like to um, unmute and ask a question of Kelsey, um, feel free to do that now. Hello, it's Florence. <laughs> No, I thought so. <laughs> um, did you manage to do, are you allowed to dive in the Galapagos? Yeah, you are. We just, we didn't fit it into our plan, okay. but we did a lot of snorkeling and honestly, I think it was pretty close. Yeah. Are there any uh, corals there and is there any evidence of coral bleaching? That gets a question. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of coral there as, uh, okay. There's, there's a decent amount of coral there, but honestly, I thought there was a lot of stuff there that also just reminded me of diving up here. Like there's a lot of like coral and algae and even like red, green, brown algae that lives there. So it was a weird mix of a little bit of tropical and a little bit of at home. Mm -hmm. um, there's definitely a little bit of coral bleaching. I don't know how bad it is compared to the rest of the world. Um, and then, you know, like average amounts, I suppose, of coral being washed up on shore. Okay. okay I've got a quick question. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you go for it. Um, because it the Galapagos, they're volcanic islands. Is that correct? Yes. Which brings me to, where did the animals come from? Man, this is still a question that I'm <laughs> trying to figure out the answer because to. Because if the one know, I can't the, figure out yet is the tortoise. <laughs> well, no. If if it came from a volcano, there was nothing mm -hmm. there, a rock. Yeah. So they were introduced so they, somehow. Yeah, they they did. Uh, migrate there on their own just millions of years ago um so i guess things like the birds make sense to me or even the plant life their own stuff being distributed to the islands makes sense i'm hung up like i said on the tortoises uh it, it's said that they could have just drifted there um but they are rather large and bulky and heavy like 250 kilograms so uh, i i don't have a good answer for you i've been looking this up online as well they made it there yeah, incredible. Any final questions or comments from the group? I did have another question. Do it. Um, was there um, much evidence? I know this is just because of my error. What was there much evidence of plastic pollution? Honestly, like not a ton. It was the the cleanest place I've ever visited. Uh, the only times that I saw a lot of like trash was in the harbors. And then the one beach that we visited that had a lot of trash on it, it happened to be like a, a military beach uh, where there were a lot of like people nearby. So just kind of like normal, normal mm -hmm. trash that would end up on the beach. I was really impressed though with how little there was. Okay, thank you. And yeah, a no question from Martina. Uh, is there any regulation on the boats that can be used around the islands? Example, electric mm -hmm. rather than diesel. I don't know for sure the answer to this, uh, but I don't think so. Um, they are, when it comes to vehicles, and I'm not sure actually that this even applies to boats, you're not allowed to have any like additional vehicles. So I, I think it was in the late nineties where they went, okay, everybody that has a vehicle on the island now, you guys are the only ones that are allowed to have vehicles. And if you need a new one, you're responsible for like transporting it to the mainland and then bringing a new one back. But the number, like the total number you have can't change. Um, so boats, you're allowed to bring in your own uh, private yacht, but you have to have it still with a, a naturalist on board in order to visit those spaces. And you have to check with the government to see what sites you can go to when, because that part is controlled really, really tightly. 
Um, so I would assume that all of the regular tour operators that have boats there have some sort of regulation, but I'm not sure what it is. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. No well, I think we will wrap it up there. Um, and Kelsey, I know you mentioned um, if anybody wanted to stay on, did you, <laughs> did you want to stay on? Yeah. <laughs> So, um, I mean, I, I definitely can, or we can do, we can do part oh, two. Do. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, let's, let's stay on for, for those people. I know we said that we'd wrap up at, um, 8.15. So, um, if you'd like to stay great, um, and, uh, thank you for, um, for coming to our, the return of our Ocean Health Speaker Series. And I want to thank Kelsey so much. It's so inspiring and it just looked like an amazing trip and, uh, made me want to, to get there, um, <laughs> Sooner rather than later, absolutely. So thank you very much. Yeah. And to everybody that came, thank you very much. And you, the recording will be available on our website as of tomorrow. And I put the link in the chat, but it's just on our oceanambassadorscanada.org website. And we have a tab for the speaker series. So you'll be able to, to see it there. And I think, Kelsey, we might have to have uh, another talk um, about this. Uh, maybe one area more in depth as well would be great. <laughs> Yeah, definitely very hard much. to decide with all the cool Thanks stuff. Everyone Thanks everyone that um, came and whoever um, wants to stay on and, and uh, Kelsey, we can maybe carry on for another 15 minutes for those that are interested. <laughs> yeah, that sounds good. Okay. Thanks, Kelsey. Uh, no worries. Okay, let me see what is here. I just have to go back to a couple of birds because this bird was really sweet. Uh, apparently the Galapagos flycatcher is known as one of the friendliest birds on the island and is known to come really close to humans. I didn't know that before I met this bird, so I thought that just this bird was the friendliest bird on the island. Um, according to that same guidebook that doesn't like the doves, um, these birds will apparently even accept insects from your hand. Uh, they're pretty widespread around the islands. Um, and this is, again, like one of the birds that is affected by the parasite that I was talking about here. So that's an image of the parasite. Um, there's also invasive ants that are doing a similar thing to a lot of these birds where they're affecting the young. And then they, uh, yeah, they just don't survive. Sorry, there we go. Okay, there's a few videos. Uh, this video is of a marble gray that was just hanging out on the bottom. We saw many marbled rays. So this was one of those things where it was like, okay, another marbled ray. I feel very entitled saying that, I know. Uh, sometimes they were just on like an open sandy bottom like this. And sometimes they were hiding under rocks or like in caves. Um, I really enjoy the way that they swim. They're incredibly graceful underwater and surprisingly fast when they want to be. Um... These are some white tip sharks. I've never seen so many white tip reef sharks in my life before. They were regularly just in the water with us when we were snorkeling. That bright yellow fish is a guinea fowl puffer fish. It's the male version. Um, and that fish that we just passed over was a king angel fish. They're really nice. They have this bright neon blue line on their upper and lower fins. The puffer fish is really shy. This is Adam making a video right now, and he tried really hard to be friendly with it, but it just kept hiding. And this beautiful fish with the nice toothy smile is a Mexican hog's head. The bone on its head. So that yellow fish is the male version, and this is the female pucker fish. It is black with white spots. I think they're a, a pretty hot couple there, yellow and then black and white polka dots. Um, this was an incredibly large male sea turtle. Uh, you can tell that it's a male sea turtle by the massive tail that it has. It actually kind of grossed me out how big this tail was because I've never seen such a large sea, li uh, sea turtle tail before. Um, I feel like every time I've seen the sea turtles, it's been in like Hawaii and there it's like a little bit harder to distinguish male and female. 
I've never seen as many turtles as I did here. Um, and they were also like very sociable. They would swim right up to you or if you were snorkeling on the surface, they'd swim right underneath you and did not care about human presence at all. Um, we regularly saw them eating some of this like green and red algae. Um, so it's funny because you could just hover above them and watch them do their thing for a while. You can tell that this one is a female because it doesn't have a long tail at all. You can back, like hardly see it underneath the shell there. Okay. You get the idea. This was something really cool that I saw, which was a cell. So it is like a pelagic tunicate if that helps. Tunicates are the invertebrates that are most closely related to us, to vertebrates. Um, and often, I mean, there, there's a colonial version that like exists on a lot of the bottom of people's boats and stuff, or you'll often see them in the intertidal as like a, a yellow or orangey sponge like hovering on a rock. Um, but this was my first time actually seeing a cell firsthand. So that was really cool. Um, this one lights up a little bit. If you look at the top edge, um, you can see it kind of shines and sparkles there before the fin comes through. I was definitely the most excited person about, about this on our boat. Everybody else was just like, get these jellyfish out of my face. So, uh, this starts out like, oh, come on. One of these did not play. This starts out with a turtle, hopefully soon. Um, but the cool part about this video is at the end. Um, this is Adam filming. He decided to turn at the last second to see if there was anything else down there before he surfaced and he saw a hammerhead. So that was really exciting <laughs> for him. <laughs> and then I think I only have two left here. <laughs> Going through them quick. Um, this next part, these are, again, sharks to begin with, but then before the video ends, you'll see there's an entire field of garden eels. So those are all those little hooks popping out, out of the, out of the sandy bottom. Those are eels that like to spend most of their time mostly embedded in the sand like that and pop their heads up. They're also very shy. So as soon as they see you, they kind of suck back into their little burrows. Okay, and then the last thing were these mobular rays. So they swam by underneath us and they're just incredibly speedy. And I think that that video is so cool because it looks like we've sped up the timing on them swimming away, but this is all real time. And that's everything. <laughs> I mean, there's more, but, but that's all I have in the presentation. So thank you all for sticking around. I'm yeah. impressed with how many of you guys stayed. <laughs> I know, I know. It's so cool, Kelsey. <laughs> thank you so much. And thanks everybody yeah, thank for being part of part two. Yeah. <laughs> Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back next month. Stay tuned. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. That was really good. Thanks for coming. Thank so much. Yeah. Thanks, Kelsey. <laughs> Very cool. Thanks, Kels. <laughs> Thanks it for coming. This is the second time around. <laughs> She's a little bit faster. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you, Kelsey's mom. Nice to see you too, Allison. <laughs> Shh. Tried to answer a question last minute, but the person left. Huh. Was... What was the answer? To the um, it, it was about uh, like whose uh, tour group we went with and that kind of thing because uh, the person went to visit the Galapagos this summer. But I got so in, emailed me before she left. So, <laughs> um, somebody said show us pepper. <laughs> it's just my cousin. That was me. <laughs> we'll get. It. Don't worry. We'll show pepper. Pepper can come out now. You, you can realize as soon as we get off, we're gonna. Cousin. Hello. <laughs> Sorry, I said that really rudely too. Oh, that's just my cousin. That's not what I meant. Thank you for coming. <laughs>
Yeah, thanks. Wow. Yes, please show us pepper. You Thank can you see Adam me. too. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. Yeah. Pepper. Oh. Hello, Pepper. Hi, Pepper. Hello, Pepper. 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 Pepper's big. Yeah. Very asleep. More relaxed than the last time you saw her at your house, right? <laughs> yeah, she looks pretty relaxed. Oh, 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 you can't move. Okay. Look at her. Yeah, she's big. Wow. She's, you know, she's a little bit heavier these days. Yeah. A little <laughs> heavier when she, than when she came to the leadership camp camping in the summer. I know. She was so small and easy to deal with then. Yeah. 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 That was impressive. Um, My that... cruising friend just texted me that they watched and they said it makes them want to go cruising again. Oh my gosh. You know, you, uh, you guys reminded me of, of you guys. Actually, I was reminded of you guys when I was on the on the boat. I was like, I just kind of want to stay here forever. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should do what you guys did. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was remembering the baths and, and the snorkeling at the baths in Virgin Gorda. Okay. So beautiful there. Nice. It's nice to be in a marine yeah. environment that's protected because then yeah. you see so much. It's it's so different yeah. from being where it's not protected. And like seriously, the animals just do not care. So they they just come right up to you and like I don't know. Here it's different. There they kind of operate on the like principle of common sense and just like respecting the animals. And I don't think we could ever get away with that here because it's a completely different system. But I kind of wish yeah. we could. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so much diversity and color. Yeah, yeah, it was incredible. Um, I have a, a great appreciation for those islands. Just going there and then you're just constantly seeing things. Yeah. It felt really empty coming back home and getting off the plane. <laughs> Culture shock yeah. coming back home. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, yeah. We, on the boat, the, the bathrooms, we each had our own private bathroom, but the bathrooms were just like, the wall was just a big window. And like, like you said, there's nobody around. It's a national park. It's all well regulated. So I would frequently just like, you know, <laughs> bathe with the window open and look out at the beautiful view. And one morning, this penguin just like swam by and <laughs> looked at me. <laughs> Such cool experiences. You guys must have so many like that. Yeah, I know. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah I remember showering on a, on a, uh, during a sunrise and there was no one else in the harbor. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice <laughs> that was really great Kelsey yeah that was fun it flew by I don't know what happened there like my display screen totally froze and I was just using my iPad and then it I had to like turn it off unplug it and redo it yeah yeah otherwise I would have definitely finished that talk in time so it was great <laughs> really good hey, Margo. Hello, Kelsey. That was good. Thank you. Thanks. I'm glad you were able to make it. A little late. I got to go back and catch the beginning. That's okay. <laughs> it's just like sea lions and stuff. It's not that important. Crabs. Yeah. I actually, I got a little bit anxious when Allison was talking about you and Andre being there. And I was like, oh no, I'm talking about birds. What if Andre asks me a question about birds? <laughs> <laughs> he did make I know, I know the answer. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. The birds were really cool though. I appreciated them. Yeah, well, it sounds like <laughs> just an incredible trip. Yeah, it really was. It was uh, the best. Well, thanks everyone. Yeah. yeah. All yeah. You Thank you. Kelsey, <laughs> Kelsey can go and have a glass of wine or something. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah, you thanks too. for putting this on and it was really good. Great. I enjoyed it. Thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So soon yeah. after you got back too. I know. It's like just enough time to digest everything and go through the fifteen hundred photos and videos. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's really amazing. You were able to do that so quickly. That's really good. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. That was fun. All right. Well, good night, everybody. Thanks good again. Good night. Take care. Bye bye. bye.